Good morning and welcome to all of you. We're glad that all of you guys are here with us this morning. I'm Alex, our high school pastor, and I have the awesome privilege to be able to break open God's word with you this morning. If you've been joining us for any length of time at this point, you know that we've not been really in a series. We've, it's been a journey as we have walked through the gospel of Mark, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, starting all the way back in January now, which is crazy to me that we're now almost in month seven, really, of walking through the gospel of Mark that has been just an amazing time for me. Hopefully it has been for you as well to get to see a, a deeper understanding and maybe some more context to some of your favorite scriptures and stories that are in the Gospels as we walk through this together. And today we're going to continue, obviously, to do so. Last week, uh, Pastor Steve did an awesome job wrapping up chapter 6 for us. So today we are going to be starting uh, fresh in Mark chapter 7, continuing on here in the Gospel. Uh, But before we get into the text this morning, um, I want us to, to understand what's about to happen. So we are about to see the largest confrontation, or really the longest confrontation, uh, between Jesus and the religious elite that is recorded all in the book of Mark. There's not anywhere else in the book of Mark that we are going to see a confrontation to this caliber take place. But really, it shouldn't come to us as a surprise that something like this would happen, uh, because there are two groups that are surrounding Jesus that really could not be more different. There is one group who is made up of people who love Jesus, who follow him. It's his friends, his family, the people who worship him, who are are going everywhere that he goes. But then there's another group that is with Jesus, and that is a group that is made up of people who hate him, who despise everything he is about. In fact, at this point, we know that this group is in the process of planning his murder. And so before we get into what we're going to read today, I I want us to understand something. That this is how it's always been, and this is how it always will be. There has always been a group who has loved and worshipped Jesus, and there's always been a group who has hated him, who has despised him in everything that he is about. But it is also always going to be the case. There is always going to be a group that loves and worships Jesus and a group that hates him and despises everything that he stands for. So my question for us this morning and for each of you this morning is which group are you in? I'm not asking if you are a good person. I'm not asking if you love your family and take care of them. I'm not even asking if you are a regular attender of our church or another church or a part of a small group or a serve team. The question that I am asking you is what group are you in? Are you a part of the group that fully trusts Jesus or are you a part of the group that fully rejects him? Because it's impossible for you to be in both, but as equally as impossible for you to be in neither. You fully trust him or you fully reject him. There is no middle ground. And so with that question in mind, I want us to begin reading in God's word this morning. Now, I'm not going to read the whole section of scripture for time's sake and then go back and break it down. We're just going to hear in a moment start right in verse 1 and then walk through it together uh, because there's a lot of information that we need to talk through and unpack in today's scripture. However, we are going to be in Mark chapter 7 starting in verse 1. So if you want to turn your Bibles there or if you have it on your phone, you're welcome to do so as well. As you were trying to find your place, there's a little bit of a structure that I do want you to, to understand as we get into this this morning, that we are going to see two 
main groupings um, in this text. The first being we are going to see the religious accusations that are given to Jesus, and then we are going to see Jesus' answer to them. Uh, But both of these structures come together under one main point, which is that surface-level holiness can never replace a deeply rooted godliness. So let's go ahead and begin reading in verse 1 together, starting with the the religious accusations that we are going to see. So starting in verse 1, it begins, "...the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem." Now, we're going to push pause there for just a moment. I know it's not all of verse 1, but there's a few things we need to understand even in this short amount of a verse here. So, at this point, the religious leaders are looking for any reason that they can criticize and chastise and try to really condemn Jesus. It has no longer just been a, hey, we're going to check out and kind of look from the background and see what this guy's all about. We don't really agree with it, but, you know, we're just, we're just trying to look and see what he's doing. It, it's no longer that anymore. Now it has fully shifted into an all-out witch hunt of sorts uh, for them to be able to accuse Jesus. Um, and they're going to spare no expense at doing so, at trying to find something they can accuse Jesus of. See, what we notice here is that these men, this group, traveled from Jerusalem to where Jesus now is currently at. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, why is that such a big deal? It's a big deal because Jerusalem is not just a quick stroll, few block walk down the road to where Jesus is at. It isn't a, you know evening donkey ride to get to where Jesus is teaching and where he is at with this group. In fact, Jerusalem was over 50 miles away from where Jesus is at with his disciples at this point, which what we know from back then is they followed a a rule really of that they would travel a day's journey and a day's journey for these men would be somewhere between 20 and 25 miles. That means we are talking at a minimum of a two days worth of traveling in order for them to get to where Jesus is teaching so they could find something to condemn him for. But what we also have to remember is that this is not this particular group's first time in doing this. If you remember four chapters ago in chapter 3, uh, verse 22, we see this same group trying to do the exact same thing. They travel from Jerusalem to where Jesus is teaching and they make some accusations. At that point, the accusation was that Jesus was filled with a demon, and that is how he was able to perform the miracles that he was performing. Now, as Jesus is very smart and intelligent, and he deals with the situation with really logic and telling a couple parables, and that's kind of the end of it, and now they're embarrassed, and they leave, and they go away. So now this is the second attempt at this group trying to catch Jesus, um, being sent from Jerusalem for for the purpose of just seeing what Christ could be doing, the the wrong thing that he could be doing. And as you're going to see in just a moment, again, this was no casual conversation or casual accusation. They they came in ready with their guns loaded to, to attack both Jesus and his disciples. But before we get into the situation itself, you notice here in this first part of verse 1 that there's two different groups that have come from Jerusalem. And I think it's important that we at least know a little bit of the difference between the two as we will kind of come into contact again later um, in our scripture about this. So first we have the Pharisees, which probably most of us are familiar with who the Pharisees are, but maybe not so much as familiar as as what what they do, what their role is. So the Pharisees, as we know, they were religious men. They were leaders. And their main job, in a nutshell, was for them to enforce the law of Moses, both in their own life and in the lives of the people in their communities. Now, that is not a full, robust description of them, and there's a lot of different nuances there. But for today, I think that's a good enough snapshot of what their job is. But then you'll notice there was a second group of people in verse 1. And it says, uh, the teachers of the law which I think that's a great description of their role. But if you have any other translation other than the NIV, you will see that it 
tells us who they were. They were the scribes. So you have the Pharisees and you have the scribes. So if you have your own Bible and you want to mark that right there, that's how I'm going to refer to them the rest of today is that they are the scribes. And their role is to be teachers of the law. Um, what their job was, uh, was in part, as you can imagine, by understanding their name, was to write copies of the Mosaic Law. Uh, they were the ones who helped interpret the Mosaic Law, and they were also the ones who wrote commentaries about the law. So we have one people who write and copy and write I interpretations and commentaries of the law, and then we have uh, another group who helps enforce the law of Moses. So essentially what we have here is that one religious group who had been following Jesus around for a long time now, which was the Pharisees, kept getting embarrassed. So for a second time now, they have called their friends from Jerusalem to join them in their efforts because who better to catch Jesus making a mistake in the Mosaic law than the ones who write, copy, interpret, and write commentary on the Mosaic law themselves. So that's, that's who we have here on the scene. Let's continue on in verse 1 and 2 and see what else we have here. It says, They gathered around Jesus, and they saw some of the disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. At this point, again, the Pharisees and the scribes are watching Jesus with a very scrupulous eye, trying to figure out anything that he could just, even just slightly do wrong, that they can now point the finger and say, nope, you've messed that up, and now we're going to deal with you. And as you can probably know, if you've ever been in this situation where you've come into a place to, to listen to a person or to see an event just already with a bad attitude and ready to criticize, it doesn't take you very long to find something wrong with whatever you are watching or listening to, right? It's really easy to do that. And so as you would think, this is exactly what happens. It doesn't take very long for these men to see something that they perceive as wrong and are going to jump on it. However, at this point, I'm not really worried about us catching on to what these Pharisees and scribes thought they caught Jesus and his disciples in. In fact, first, I want us to catch something else. It's a truth that is embedded in these two scriptures that may not seem overly obvious, but as I was preparing for this message, it was something that in a new way kind of jumped off the page to me. These men were standing in the literal presence of God. And something up until this point was reserved for one man on one day of the year. If you go back to the Old Testament, you know that one priest on one day of the year was able to experience the literal presence of God. This was on the Day of Atonement. The, the high priest was able to enter into the Holy of Holies and experience the presence of God there. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes all into that. But at that time in the Old Testament, experience the present, experiencing the presence of God was reserved for one man, one time of the year. But now that Jesus had taken on flesh, anybody who had come or who would come to him could experience God's presence. So these religious men that had gathered next to Jesus or were gathered next to Jesus, yet they kept their eyes and kept their attention to other things. So you may be wondering at this point, okay, so, so what? What does, what does that mean? It means that they were standing in the presence of God, yet they actively chose to give their attention to other things. And because of it, they missed out on what God could have done in their life and what Jesus would have wanted to do in their life. And as I read this, I just think, man, you know, what a waste of an opportunity for these guys. But it also causes me to reflect inwardly. And to think that my hope and my prayer is that may we never be a church and may you and I never be individuals who get to experience the presence of God yet give our attention to other things. For it will cause us to miss out on the blessings that God wants to do both in our church and in your life. They stood in God's presence, but they were distracted. How often 
Is that the truth for us? That we come in to church ready to experience what God has for us, but we're distracted. Our attention's on other things. It's on our kids. It's on what we're having for lunch. It's having uh, where we're going next. And we're completely distracted from what God wants to do with us. With that truth in mind, let's continue looking at these religious leaders and what they thought God or what they thought they had caught Jesus um, and his disciples doing. So at the end of these two verses, it says, They were eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Now, you may be asking yourself, what does it mean to have defiled hands? Does it mean they, they didn't wash them? Does it mean you know, they were out doing something wrong and now they needed to, to be corrected about it? Lucky for all of us in the room, verses 3 and 4 gives us an answer here. So let's read that together. It says, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding on to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Now, for the most part, I think these verses probably make sense, as they should. Uh, because if we remember, Mark is writing to a non-Jewish audience. A group who would have had no clue some of the Jewish customs and traditions of what was normal for them. So he has to go into some pretty specific detail to help them understand. And guess what? We're in the same position 2,000 years later. right? None of us are Jewish in here. We don't subscribe to the, to the Jewish faith. So we have to have a little bit of context and understanding. So I think that makes sense. But I think there is also a few things that if we can iron out a little bit here in these two verses, we will better understand exactly what is going on. So again, back in the Old Testament, uh, the law of God was given to Moses in order to set the nation of Israel aside as a chosen people. The Old Testament tells us that they were to be a holy nation. They were supposed to be a nation that was set aside for God's purposes. They were supposed to speak different. They were supposed to act different. They were supposed to do things differently. And many of these laws uh, that they were given pertained uh, to keeping the Israelites physically healthy by uh, practicing certain hygiene routines. And so that meant there were things that you could come in contact with. There are things that you could experience that would cause you uh, to be deemed ceremonially unclean. Uh, some of these things, I don't have time to run through all of them, but I'll list a couple of them real fast. Would be touching a dead body. All right, I think that makes sense. Like you're going to be unclean if you touch a dead body. That makes sense. Um, having some sort of infectious disease. If you have something that's contagious, you're deemed ceremonially unclean. You want to stay away from everybody else. Um, handling the ashes of certain dead animals would get you deemed ceremonially unclean. Or having physical contact with anybody who is also deemed unclean. Now, all of these are, are pretty reasonable, and they make sense. And those are just a few of them. And if you're interested in learning all of about them, I would encourage you to go read um, in parts of Leviticus, chapter 18. 19, 20, 21, 22. There's a lot of interesting laws when it comes to, to physical cleanliness there. And as you could imagine, that if there is a way to be deemed unclean, um, then there is also a way for you to be brought back into the group and deemed clean once again. But here is the issue. If you're an individual who wants to look better than somebody else, if you're an individual who wants to look more righteous than the person next to you, if you are an individual or a group who is interested in holding power and authority and controlling people, then what might you do? You might then take what God had instituted, make some adjustments, and tell the people that this came from God, and therefore you're expected to do these things, that God didn't give us, but we heard from God. Now do these things, otherwise you are going to be considered unclean before God. Nobody wants to be considered unclean before God, so they're going to follow them. And thus you have a tradition that starts to develop. The specific tradition that's being mentioned here went something like this. All right, Jewish Joe goes out to the marketplace to go and buy some, some food for his family. He's going to go buy some meat. And he goes out to the marketplace and, and gets some meat. But, however, uh, here's the problem. 
The guy that, that Joe is buying this meat from, um, it's possible that he could have came in contact with somebody who was unclean. And it's also possible that Joe could have come in, in contact with the guy who was selling that meat, who came in contact with somebody who was unclean, who could have come in contact with somebody who was unclean, but really that person could have also come in contact with somebody who was unclean. But, oh my goodness, what if that person came in contact with somebody who was unclean? Now we have a problem on our hands and we're unclean before the Lord because the guy who I bought the meat from, who could have touched the meat, could have come in contact with somebody who was unclean eight people ago. So now, now the whole situation's unclean and we need to do something about this in order for us to look better than them, right? So th that's the mentality that, that we see here. And so what they would have to do, according to the tradition, was that then they would have to come home and do a physical washing. They're going to have to scrub down everything, themselves, the food, uh, the, the pots and the pans and the utensils that may be used to cook the food, because we need to make sure all of that's clean, the countertops, everything. We're scrubbing all of that stuff down. But not only that, I mean, because maybe that would make sense a little bit, but we also have to have a spiritual cleaning for our food and our pots and pans. We've got to break out the oil. And we, the, the interesting word that's used here to describe this is rantizo. So baptizo in the original language is to fully dunk, emerge, scrub, clean, right? That's where we get the word baptized. That's why we believe in full immersion baptism. But the, the word in Greek that they use here is rantizo, which means to sprinkle, to sprinkle a little bit of water or oil or whatever it was that they used to have a spiritual cleaning of everything. And they created these rules to seem righteous and have power over others. And so this is what they are trying to catch Jesus and his disciples in at this very moment. Let's read verse 5 and see what the Pharisees and teachers of the law specifically say about this. He says, so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked, I'm going to pause you just for a brief second and say, that is not an honest uh, Ask. If you look at the, again, the original word, that word means to interrogate. So they're not just like, hey, Jesus, we want to ask you a question. We've got something that we really want to know about. We're confused. No, it's like, hey, why are you doing this? It's, this is time for their accusation. So really it could say, so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law interrogated Jesus. Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Because of what we know about the Pharisees and the scribes, we can begin to understand that they have uh, no um, thought. That it's not even a consideration in this moment that they want to ask an honest question. We know that they are not looking to give Jesus a little bit of constructive criticism and hopeful that he could have an honest conversation about why his guys are doing what they are doing. They're not interested in just saying, hey, Jesus, we noticed John was using the bathroom out in the woods, and now he's touched the bread, and there was no hand washing that was going on. So, like, we need to address this. You need, you need to have him clean up. No, none of that is the scenario that's happening. Rather, this question is an accusation. It's an attack on Jesus himself. This is what they hoped to be the I got you moment for them. And what is most interesting here, though, it's not really what they were trying to accomplish. But what I find most interesting and what happens in the question that they ask is the intrinsic irony that is involved. You see, this, tr this tradition that was held by the Pharisees and the scribes as one that was you know, sent from God and given to the elders and passed down from generation to generation only dealt with the, the ceremonially um, unclean. And at this point, the only people who were expected to be ceremonially clean and would be a held to, to account and that standard by religious leaders were those who taught in the temple, those who were considered rabbis. That means that the very people who traveled 50 miles from Jerusalem to discredit Jesus as a teacher and healer, in fact, did the exact opposite. By asking their question that was meant as an accusation, these men recognized Jesus as the authoritative teacher that he was. They instead made themselves look foolish and discredited any agenda that they had brought with them. And all of that happened without Jesus saying a single 
word to them. They did this all themselves. And I mention that because I think it stands as a great reminder for all of us that no matter what the world says about Jesus or his bride, he will always receive the recognition that he is due. And for the one who is in this room, who has not personally recognized Jesus as Savior and Lord, this serves as a warning that at the end of this life, it will be you as the one who stands looking foolish before God when you hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. God and Jesus will always receive the recognition that is due them. And you can either recognize Jesus now and spend eternity with him, or you can recognize Jesus later and spend eternity separated from him. And the choice is yours, how Jesus will receive that recognition from you. Now, I don't say that in judgment or in condemnation. I say that as an encouragement, really, because I have tasted in this and seen that the Lord is good. And all of the blessings that come from being able to walk with Christ each and every day and have a relationship with him. And the blessings that we know that are to come because of it. And so as we consider what is happening with the the Pharisees and the scribes, I think it forces us to look inwardly as well to make sure that we have in fact recognized Jesus for who he truly is. So this is the religious accusation, the first part of what is going on here. But then we see, we see a second part, and that's Jesus' answer to these men. Starting in verse 6, it says, He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. After the Pharisees and scribes had already managed to embarrass themselves without Jesus even speaking up about anything, now Jesus does respond to them. And in normal Jesus fashion, he uses scripture to fight against verbal attacks from his enemies. And again, real quickly, I think that's a great reminder for us, is that when we are attacked as Christians, man, we have the truth of God's word that we are able to stand upon and stand upon it firmly. Because although the world may seem to think they have the truth, we know that what scripture says is final. And we can use that to encourage one another. We can use that to fight back against a group that's pushing in on us. And we can use that in response as we are attacked because of our beliefs. But what we should notice about Jesus is that he never uses scripture flippantly. He never uses scripture out of context or without a specific purpose. There is never a point that you're going to see in the gospel of Mark or in any other gospel for that matter where Jesus has a run-in with somebody or even in this specific instance has a run-in with the Pharisees and the scribes. It's like, oh my goodness, man, they are just hammering away, peppering me with these questions. But you know what? I can do all things through me who strengthens me, right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, oh, my goodness, man, this is such a tough situation. But you know what? I know the plans the Lord has for me, ones to prosper me, you know, not for my harm, but for my... No, that Jesus, every single time that he uses scripture to combat something, he does it to get at the very heart of the issue of the person or the group that is coming after him. And it is always in context and it is always um, in the correct mindset of what he is trying to accomplish. It's never outside of that. And this is exactly what Jesus does here. The scripture that he quotes comes from two different places in the Old Testament. The first being Isaiah 29. And there is a lot of significance uh, that comes with him quoting Isaiah 29. And to understand that, we need to take a look and understand a little bit of the, the history of the nation of Israel. So this is what we know about Israel at this point. They have been divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And at the time of Isaiah's writing, the northern kingdom has collapsed by, and was overtaken by the Assyrians, and now the Assyrians are on the doorstep of the southern kingdom of Judah, knocking, ready to attack them as well. 
And so Isaiah's writing, telling them, hey, you guys need to repent and you need to turn back to God. Other these, otherwise, these people are going to overtake them or overtake you as well as they have already overtaken the northern kingdom. But the real kicker is that Isaiah specifically in chapter 29 is not just writing about the general takeover of the southern kingdom. He is specifically writing about the siege and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But what was the city of Jerusalem? Well, seven, in 700 BC, when this is going on, the city of Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. But if you fast forward to the men who are standing before Jesus, Jerusalem is the city in which these men just hiked 50 miles from to come attack Jesus. It was the city where that was the center of their faith. It was the city where the temple was at. It was where the city where the scriptures were interpreted. It was the city where the man-made traditions were created. And it was the city in which its leaders had rejected the Messiah and their destruction was coming. Jesus didn't mince words with these men. And he quickly got to the heart of their pride and their divergence from God's word. And so I think we can all sort of see how when you come ready to pepper someone with questions and someone comes back at you like that and continues to do so, why you might not like that specific person, especially if you were trying to seem righteous and all-knowing um, around this other group of, of Jews, right? So they had no liking of Jesus whatsoever, which we've learned through the past several months. But I think this just stands as another reminder that the Pharisees and the scribes could not stand Jesus because he stood firm on God's word and used it in response in an accurate way every time he was attacked. Let's go on to verses 10 through 13. We're going to skip verse 9. Or I'm going to come back to it at the end, but you'll see why. So let's start here in verse 10 and continue on. For Moses said... Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Seems a little bit insane there, or maybe a little dramatic, uh, for just for cursing your mother and father. But in verse 11, it goes on. But you say, if anyone declares that what the Lord might, uh, have, might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like this. The second book in Scripture that Jesus makes reference to is the book of Exodus. The two verses that he is pulling together here, if you want to jot them down so you can look at them later, is Exodus 20, verse 12. That's Exodus 20, verse 12. And then Exodus 21, verse 17. And this is where, in the history of the nation of Israel, that the Lord gives Moses um, many laws and instructions about those laws for the nation of Israel. One of them being how children should be in relationship with their parents. Now, we may not all know ex it by the, its reference, but I think we are all familiar with the command at this point um, that is given that you should honor your father and mother. But I do suspect, however, that we are probably less familiar with the second scripture that Jesus pulls in here from Exodus 21, 17, that says, anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. All you really need to know about that scripture specifically uh, for what Jesus is getting at is this was given and is in reference to an individual uh, who were to plan any harm toward their parents. And if that was the case, they should be done away with. Uh, they, you should not in any way be planning harm toward your mom and dad. And if you do so, that is worthy of death. Because to plan um, any kind of harm toward them is to hope that they would die and to plan their death is worthy of death yourself. And so that's what, what Jesus is kind of explaining here. But the nuance here is that this included intentionally not providing for or taking care of them when they were older. Because of that, the Pharisees uh, and the elders, those again who were in the group who wanted to look better than other people, decided that they didn't like that rule. They didn't like that if you didn't take care of mom and dad that you could be put to death, which 
to a certain extent, maybe if, if that is your mentality, is at least a little bit reasonable. Because at some point when your parents get older and you're expected to take care of them, they are now a financial liability. And if they're a financial liability, that means that you can't spend your money on the things you want to spend your money on if you are expected to financially provide for your parents in their later years. And because there is less room uh, for spending things of pleasure when you have to have the responsibility of taking care of someone else. And I'm sure there are many of us in this room who at this point in this, the season of life that we are in can relate to that. We have elderly parents who we are trying to take care of. And because of that, there is in fact less room in our family budget for us to be able to go and spend it on the vacation we want or on the boat that we want or on the fill in the blank that we want because we have the, res the financial responsibility of seeing our parents uh, through, through the end of life and their care. Or for some of us in this room, we can relate to this because we have children. And we know that as you have children, there is less room for spending things on what you personally want as you are financially taking care of the kids that God has blessed you with. So because of this command that God had given them that they didn't like, a group of religious leaders at some point in the history of the nation of Israel tried to create a workaround for the Lord's command. And they did all of this um, because eventually the, this tradition that was established a long time ago would then carry more weight and more influence in the life of the Jews than God's original command. And they wrapped it all in a nice pretty package and called it Corbin. So it went something like this. All right, you don't want to provide for your mom and dad at the end of your life. Well, we'll figure out a way to get around this. So what we're going to do is in order for you not to have to provide for your mom and dad at the end of your life and you get to spend your money how you want, this is how it's going to go down. You're going to write a will. And in that will, you are going to state that the end, at the end of your life, all of your assets, including the assets that would be used to take care of mom and dad in their later years of life, um, will be given to the, to the temple. Therefore, since it's given to the temple, those assets are no longer yours. Those are God's, as if they weren't God's to begin with, right? Um, but those are God's. And because they are now God's and not yours, you are now absolved of any responsibility of taking care of your parents later on in life. But that wasn't where it stopped. They weren't required to give a single dollar of what was supposed to be willed to the temple currently. Until they died, they were able to spend their money however they wanted. So they were able to get out of the responsibility of taking care of their parents. They were able to be, spend their money how they want instead of how God commanded them to. And because of this holy tradition that they had created, they were no longer going to have to be put to death for not care taking care of their parents. And they stood righteous before the Lord because they had figured out a workaround, how to get um, from what God had commanded to what they actually wanted to do. And so it was a whole mess. Uh, and Jesus points out that this is a problem, and he is just giving this as an example, but he continues on to say that this nullifies the word of God, but it's not just two little things. It's not just a, a deal with, with washing and making sure things are, are clean as you eat them, and it's not just you've tried to mess up and tweak and twist God's word for how to take care of your parents, but you do many things like this. Which would have been crazy. And again, just as Jesus does, the scripture he uses is not just for no reason. These men were the experts in two things. They were the experts in the law and the prophets. And what does Jesus use to show them their hypocrisy? He uses the law of Moses and the prophet Isaiah to point out how hypocritical and how far gone that they had twisted God's word. Jesus takes care of these men and deals with these men using God's word 
by the very thing that they were supposed to be experts in. But in order to begin wrapping all this up, it doesn't just stop there. We've got to come back to verse 9. So let's read verse 9 together. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. The reason why I chose to, to save this verse to the end and, and use it um, to wrap everything up is because I think it was one of the religious leaders' biggest issues. They wanted their God to fit in a certain box that they had created. And when he did not, they followed their own man-made rules rather than following the word of God. But I can't help but think <laughs> that we're in not much of a different boat oftentimes. That this is also one of our biggest problems. That when God doesn't fit in the box of our life that we have created, that we choose to follow our own man-made rules rather than following God's word. We may not have a Corbin tradition that we follow, but we do have creative ways that we have come up as excuses and tweaks to God's word in order to do things the way we want instead of the way that God has commanded so to wrap everything up today, I want us to look at how does this apply to us? And I want to give us three modern alterations um, that maybe we don't have this Corbin tradition, but three modern alterations uh, that, that we are guilty of oftentimes, and then three biblical solutions. So what I mean by three alterations is, you know, just think of buying a pair of pants, right? You buy a pair of pants, they come in a certain size and a certain style and shape, but sometimes you have to get them altered to fit them toward you. All right, that's the, the thought process that I have by using that word, that this isn't necessarily an all-out um, refusal or denial of God's word, as in many cases in our culture. But these three things are ways that I think in modern day we have just kind of tweaked, adjusted, altered enough of God's word in order uh, for it to fit our liking rather than what God's word actually says. So let's walk through these. The first one is the for God and country attitude. The forgotten country attitude, I think, is one way that we have in modern day altered uh, what God has said. And what I mean by that is, man, I, I am very thankful that I live in a country where I have the freedoms to do a lot of things. I am thankful for the freedom to be able to show up on church on Sundays and Thursdays and be able to worship freely. I'm thankful for the freedom to be able to go shoot my guns when I want to, where I want, well, sort of where I want to, but at least when I want to. Um, <laughs> I'm thankful for those freedoms. But what we have to be very careful about is that, and it's very common, um, more than what maybe we realize, is that we cannot try to allow our freedoms in this country to overshadow what God has commanded for us. And a perfect example of this, I believe, is the freedom of speech. Right? Oftentimes, there will be situations in our life when we decided we are going to yell at that person, we're going to cuss them out, we're going to give them a piece of our mind, we're going to get in that comment section on social media and let the world know how we really feel um, in a way that is not healthy and in a way that is not biblical, all under the excuse that, well, I have the freedom of speech in this country and I, so I can do that. Right? That's not what God's word tells us at all. In James, it says that we have to be careful about how we use our tongue. It's very powerful. We have to learn how to tame our tongue if we want to look like Christ. And so what I think we have to remember is that just because we have the freedom in this country to do so doesn't mean we have the freedom in Christ to do so. So anything that freedoms we may have in the United States, they don't get to overshadow God's word. God's word should always overshadow what freedoms that we have here. So that's the first one. The second one, prioritizing, serving, and giving to the community. So let me preface with, serving and giving to the community is a good thing. It's not bad. It's not wrong. Uh, when we cross into the boundary of, or cross over the boundary of it being wrong or it not being a good thing is when we we make the excuse that the reason why I don't give or I don't serve the local body of believers is because my time and my, my talents and treasures are being used elsewhere outside in the community. Uh, this is very common as a pastor. I've heard it many times, and I'm sure I will hear it many more. 
well, I can't serve because I volunteer all of my time at the Salvation Army, or I volunteer all of my time um, in, in serving whatever nonprofit group, or I can't give to the, to the church because I sponsor a child, or I help support missions, or I give to this nonprofit organization. Like, those should be things that we do above and beyond already giving and serving to God's word because of what God's word says. In Malachi chapter 3, it tells us this. This is God speaking here. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are, rob you are under a curse, you and the whole nation, because you are rob robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now the moment I read that, some of you immediately in your head went, well... That was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, nowhere are we told to specifically tithe our 10%. The New Testament just tells us that we are supposed to be a cheerful giver. I think that's very faulty logic, but I will meet you there just for a second. So let's, let's pretend that that statement is accurate, because really it's not. Um, if you believe that the only expectation in the New Testament is to be a cheerful giver, then I think it's reasonable to say, let's look at an example in the New Testament of what a cheerful giver looked like. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. They sold their property and possessions to give to anybody who was in need. Who in here is willing to sell the $70,000 pickup truck to make sure every person's need in this room is met? Right? I, most of us would be like, no way. There ain't no way I'm doing that. Like, that's my F-150. I'm not, I'm not selling that thing. And that's not the expectation. That's not what we're asking. What, we are, what Scripture tells us is that the priority for us is to give and to serve back to those who are feeding us. Many of you come week in and week out and are fed by God's word, yet do not bring your food back to the storehouse of the Lord so that process can continue on. So when we prioritize giving and serving to the community first, it is a way that we have altered what God's command actually is um, versus what we want it to fit our life so we can do what we want to do. For the third one, Christian parenting. Christian parenting, I think, is the third way that and modernly we have altered what God's commands are in order to, to fit uh, what our family wants. For many of us, we would not hesitate in saying that going to church is a priority for our family. However, what we are saying and what we are doing don't match up. They don't match up at all, actually, uh, because we say that God's um, going to church every week is a priority for me and my kids, yet we let our children's baseball schedules, basketball schedules, football schedules, sports schedules dictate when we are or we're not here. Or for some of us, we even take it a step further and are like, you know what? My little girl, my little boy, they're, they're 14 now. They can make their own decision whether they want to be here or not. And we use it all under the guise and the excuse that I think is a big problem of modern technology that, oh, it's okay, though. It's okay for our family. We watch online. We watch online. We can see it on YouTube. We can see it on Facebook. We can see it wherever. And so we don't have to be in church every Sunday. Or we don't have to be in church as much as we can be because we're watching online. But again, let's look at God's word. What does God's word say in Hebrews? That we should not abandon meeting together as some of us have become habit in. Instead, we should be encouraging one another as the day draws near. That's what Hebrews tells us. And for some of us, we have lost our concept of what it means to gather together weekly. And we have allowed distractions in our kids' lives and in our lives to all fall under the excuse of, I can watch online. But yet we wonder why we are facing a, a real pandemic in our country that's not of a health concern, but it's of a spiritual concern, where over 80% of high school students, when they graduate high school, they graduate the church. It starts with mom and dad saying, I'm going to disciple my kids, and for me in my house, I'm going to serve the Lord by making sure I am there every Sunday or as often as I can be with my family and not letting the other things of this world come ahead of that. So those are the, the three modern alterations, but quickly let's go through three biblical solutions. One, keep your focus on Jesus. That was the problem 
of the Pharisees. If we don't want to be the, the hypocrites and the issues that the Pharisees had, we are to keep our eyes on Jesus and not allow the things of this world to get our attention and to distract us because it's very easy to do that. Social media does that. Politics do that. But we are to keep our focus on Jesus. Number two, match your life both inside and outside of the church. We can't walk in here singing what a beautiful name it is with hands raised on Thursdays or Sundays and then go out into the world and on a Friday night people see us stumbling out of the bar or cussing out our boss or you know whatever it is our lives inside the church and outside the church have to match and now that's not a call for perfection we are all sinners and we're going to make mistakes but that is a call to live your life in a way that reflects Jesus well. And that means matching inside and outside of the church. But lastly, and I think most importantly, we have to make our opinions fit God's word. We can't let our opinions shape what we read scripture about. It should be the other way around. When our opinions don't match God's word, our opinions are to change because God's word never does. And if we are able to do those three things, I don't think it's a foolproof method of like, we're never going to accidentally or unintentionally make changes or shifts. But if we can keep our focus on Jesus, if we can allow our lives to match inside and outside of the church, then we are able to live lives that point others back to Christ and that allow the holiness we exhibit on the inside to reflect the godliness that is deeply inside of us. Some of us here are much like the Pharisees and scribes. We have a surface level holiness, but we do not have a deeply rooted godliness. I'm going to invite the band to come out and we're going to wrap up with a song of worship. And as we do for some of us, we need to use this time realizing that we've taken our eyes off Jesus. We've lost the focus. For some of us, we need to use this under, time to make a commitment between God and our family saying, we are going to prioritize the things of the Lord. But there are some of us, I think, still here this morning to bring all this full circle that we have found ourselves in the wrong group for far too long, whether it is on purpose or unintentionally. We are in the group that hates Jesus and we need to move this morning to the group that loves and worships him in everything that we do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I do, we're going to have a time of worship together. Uh, however the Lord is moving in your life, we encourage you to respond to that. Um, it may look different than any of those two things. It may just be a time to be able to worship God one more time before we go out and spend time with family this weekend. But I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have one last song of worship together. And if it's time for you to finally wave your white flag and move from one group to a group that loves and worships Christ, I, I promise you, that our pastors up here, myself included, as we worship with you, we would have no greater privilege this morning and to be able to lead you how you can do that. So let me pray for us and then we'll wrap up together with a song of worship. God, we thank you for this, um, this morning. We thank you for the time you've given us in your word. God, we thank you that even when we find ourselves as hypocrites, even when we find ourselves messed up, God, even when we find... Um, ourselves in a, in a position where our holiness doesn't match our godliness. Lord, we know that you are calling us back to you. You are calling us to change. You are calling us to hear your word and respond to it. And Lord, I pray that that would happen this morning. However that looks like in my life and in the lives of the people here, here, Lord, we pray that you would allow your word to move, your Holy Spirit to move, and that we would respond to what you are doing um, in our lives here this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing this together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We sing Jesus today. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say He's worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
we live for you. Come on, sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and Every day, lift it up. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say He's worth, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for You. surrender this morning to our God. Sing, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust still making that decision. I want to remind you there's pastors up here who would love to talk to you. But for the rest of you, you are dismissed. Have a great 4th of July weekend. We'll see you guys next time.